Thank you again, Tommy, and the whole team for leading us so well in worship. Let's pray. God, your, de- your love is indeed strong, and your word is true. Speak to us now through your word. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, the living word. Amen. Several years ago, uh, when I was a um, youth pastor, so many years ago now, I led a group of students on an urban missions trip in the south side of Chicago. We'd done that for a number of years, and on this particular trip, we, we, would, we would work with the part of this mission uh, that would rehab, uh, board it up, they would reclaim, buy uh, really cheaply uh, abandoned homes and rehab them for families um, that were in need. Uh, one of the homes we were working on was the transition house for guys that were in recovery from different forms of addiction as part of their program. It's really fun for our students to go, and, and we, helped, we helped purchase the home. We helped buy the materials, and we worked over the course of several summers on, on getting that house uh, restored. We met a man named Otis in the course of doing that. He was uh, a man who had been through the recovery program, was kind of leading that, the programs uh, for the men in transition uh, and various forms of recovery from 12-step programs and so forth. And it was just, I, I really appreciate the way he related to our students and encouraged them. And I remember vividly one summer we worked on the kitchen, and he was so excited because we had enough funds that we'd raised uh, through our own efforts to go in, uh, at Home Depot and purchase new cabinets, new appliances, and all the stuff for the house. And he led the construction project. And it was a great sense of accomplishment for our students to do all this. He was so proud of that kitchen. And he talked. We even prayed about the, the, the conversations that they would have in that kitchen over the years and the ministry that, ministry that would be done in that house. Well, fast forward the story a couple of years, I went back to visit and that, I asked about that program. They had said, well, we had to shut that down, various issues of funding and so forth. And I asked about Otis. And Reverend Tony, who ran the mission, said, well, it's not good news. Uh, he had a relapse, stripped the house of everything of value, and has disappeared. Tore out the cabinets, tore out the appliances, sold them all, and left. I was devastated. I, mean, I vividly remember being so hurt and angry. I felt, somehow I felt personally betrayed, which I shouldn't have. Wasn't in, I did, wasn't leading there every year. But I felt like we put so much money and effort into that. How could he do that? I thought this was the guy who, you know, it was, we trusted him and that he trusted God. And I'll never forget what Reverend Tony said. I, I asked him how he dealt with it. He says, well, you know, Jeff, helping broken people, loving broken people is risky business. That was his exact words to me. He said, you, do, you put yourself out there to love people that are hurting and broken, and you're just going to get burned. It's going to happen. I learned that a long time ago. And I want to say, yeah, but, yeah, but. This is bad. This isn't good. Did you try to track him down? He says, nope, just chalk that up to investment in the kingdom and I'm not going to go chasing him. That bothered me for years. We'll come back to that in a minute. We've been looking at, through the course of our, our summer series, uh, The Way of Blessing, Jesus' t- a collection of his sermons, teachings, called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we know at least the Beatitudes in the first half of Matthew 5 were given at one time. Some of the rest of 6 and 7, which make up what we call the Sermon on the Mount, may be like the best of things that he had said and taught over the the course of his ministry. Either way, we have them collected here. And what we know the Sermon on the Mount really is, is not a new set of religious rules we have to adhere to. It's, it's best understood as a description of life in the kingdom. What does it look like for men and women to live under the rule and reign with Jesus as your king? And really, if you, when you read through the Sermon on the Mount with that lens, you see that every aspect of our lives almost is covered. No part of my life or your life is exempt, in other words. If you, want, if you claim to have Jesus as your king, that means he has rightful claim over all of you. So you don't get to say he's king of my work life, but not of my home life, or vice versa. He's king of it all, and Jesus teaches about the various aspects of the way this works itself out in human interactions in our life on this earth. We've looked at generosity and sexuality and all manner of things. Today we're going to take the text in two halves, two sections, From Matthew 5, let's look at verse 38 to 42. Matthew 5, 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile with him, go two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. We'll stop there and pick up the rest of the text in a minute. Honestly, this passage has always bothered me a little bit, if I'm being honest. As a pastor, I'd like to tell you that this is a, this, this, uh, I totally get it, and this is how you should live. There's a part of me that doesn't like this, at least some parts of it. 
Not that I'm against helping people. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a problem if I was a pastor. I don't think we should help anybody. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> or, or those that, that are in hurting. But it sounds a little bit like Jesus is just saying, get walked on. Get run over. Get taken advantage of. I mean, aren't we supposed to take a stand at some point for what's right? Aren't we supposed to stand up for justice and for what's right at some point? I mean, how far does this go? Now, you'll notice there's a familiar pattern when Jesus says, through what we've been talking about this, when he says, you've heard that it's said, but I tell you. And he does that repeatedly in the Sermon on the Mount. What he's doing there is he's drawing on Old Testament understanding of law and contrasting it with his kingdom message of righteousness. Kingdom right. So Old Testament law, kingdom righteousness. He's not doing away with the Old Testament law. Pastor Sterling preached a few weeks ago on that. He came to fulfill it, not to abolish it. But he's, he's applying it to our hearts at a deeper level. He's expanding on it. And he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, right? A tooth for a tooth. And it sounds like he's saying, but I'm changing the game. But I'm saying, don't resist. Don't pay back. Give freely. So it does sound like he's contradicting it. Now, he's quoting directly from the Old Testament, Exodus 21 and Leviticus 24, verses 19 and 20. You'll see on the screens here. Exodus 24, verses 19 and 20. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given, a person shall be given to him. So there's an Old Testament law here in Exodus 21 and Leviticus 19 and other places known in Latin by the, by the Latin commentators as the lex talionis, the law of retaliation. It does sound like Jesus is saying that we're doing away with that retaliation law and we're giving you a new law, doesn't it? But that law was given as kind of a moral code for the nation of Israel to be enforced or enacted by their divine rulers and authorities. It was a system of civil justice. So it was not a formula for personal revenge. It was how the authorities were to enact this system of justice. It does sound a little harsh and barbaric in our culture, doesn't it? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But it was actually both wise and merciful. I'll try to explain that. First of all, wise. It's wise because it took into account the natural human tendency to get even, to pay back for revenge and retaliation. Any of you uh, fans of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain, one or two? Some of you need to read more than just Twitter. <laughs> Quote from Huckleberry Finn, this is, uh, this is um, the part, well, it's a, it's a description in the conversation between Huck and, uh, with, about what a feud is. Soon as I could get bucked down by the corn cribs under the trees by ourselves, I says, did you want to kill him, Buck? Well, you bet I did. What did he ever do to you? Him? Well, he never done nothing to me. Well, then why did you want to kill him for? Well, nothing. Only it's on account of the feud. What's a feud? Why, where was you raised, boy? <laughs> Don't you know what a feud is? Never heard of it before. Tell me about it. Well, says Buck, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man and kills him. Then that other man's brother kills him. And then the other brothers on both sides and goes on for another. And then the cousins chip in and by and by everybody's killed off. And there ain't no more feud. <laughs> but it's kind of slow, and it takes a long time. I like that description. But it's, it's funny to us, but it's a description of what, maybe an extreme case, but what's in the human heart? Payback. Revenge, retaliation. Under the guise of justice. Or they deserve it. We all have a very strong tendency to overestimate the significance of the wrongs done to us and to underestimate the significance of the things we may do to wrong others. That's just in us. <laughs> a simple example is, years ago when my oldest son Noah, who's now going to be a sophomore in college, when he was playing Little League Baseball, and the umpire didn't show up. Little, you know, high school kids supposed to umpire the game, doesn't show up. So the dads were all talking about, what are we going to do? Cancel the game? They can't do that. Came to see our boys play. So they elected me. You're the pastor. You're the most impartial. <laughs> You be the umpire. This is a bad deal, by the way. Dads, if you, some of you, like, like where are you, Eric? If this ever happens with Luke, just, just reject it out of hand. So I, I put on the tiny little catcher's mask, you know, covered half my face, and the chest protector was like a, just a chest protector for me. 
anyway, and, and was calling the game. It was horrible. Now, I've, I've been known to be hard on an umpire referee in my day with my kids competing. But when you're that guy, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling it the other way, right? I'm just I'm calling out my own, my, own, my son's teammates, you know, <laughs> strike. You know, the, my own parents are yelling at me. It was, it was the worst experience of my life. We have a tendency to think, you know, when we're on one side of the fence, it's horrible, it's unjust, it's wrong because it hurts us. When the other side of the fence, hey, wait a second. Have mercy. Leniency. So it's wise because it understood the natural human tendency for retaliation and how that can go south in a real big hurry. And it was merciful because it sought to restrain that. It put parameters on it. How far does this retaliation go? How far can it go? It sort of prevented it from getting out of hand. That's the Old Testament law. Equity and punishment, tooth for tooth, but not smash all his teeth in. The point was that God's people were to surrender their right to get even or to pay back to God's authorities, ultimately leaving it in God's hands. The problem was, over time, the religious leaders and the Jewish authorities and teachers of the law had distorted this command into a justification for extracting personal revenge. It, was in, it, it, it actually was used to promote the very thing it was intended to prevent, personal retribution. So Jesus' response to this is, you've heard that it was said eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you something different, and I'll put it this way. Living in the kingdom means learning to surrender our rights. If I could sum up this little passage, it's that. Kingdom living, then and now, means learning to give up your right to get even, to have personal payback, to have your way. So the Old Testament law is useful in that it restrains the worst kinds of overreactions and it kept order in society, but in the end, it does not make you, eye for eye or tooth for tooth, does not make you a more gracious man or woman, does it? It just puts limits on how far you can go. It doesn't transform your heart. It doesn't change you and make you a generous, gracious, forgiving person. The law can't transform you. So Jesus calls us not just to the letter of the law, but to something far deeper. He's speaking directly, uh, directly against, I think, the self-obsessing, self-promoting, self-defending, self-preserving attitude of so many people in our culture today. You tell me when this is more relevant than in our culture, where we see unjust shootings of black men on the street, and we see horrific murders of police officers in retaliation in other parts of the country. Or, or just, in, just in the political system. It's not eye for eye, tooth for tooth even. Our culture is full of this because our hearts are full of it. And Jesus says, you've heard that it was said that this is okay. Let me tell you what God is really after. That was given to restrain it, to put parameters around it so you don't destroy each other. But what I want is something radically different for you. Transformed hearts. Going the extra mile, he says. And he gives us several examples of what that's going to look like, and we'll walk through them here briefly. In verse 39, he says, when we're, you're insulted or your dignity is assaulted, he uses the image of a backhanded slap across the cheek. In Greek, he's not talking about a punch in the face, not a personal assault. He's talk, the, the phraseology is indicative of a backhanded slap, sort of an insult. When you feel insulted, not assaulted, how do you respond? Where does your, how concerned are you about your reputation? What do you do with that? In, in verse 40, when your security is threatened, it says if someone asks you for your, your tunic, give them your cloak as well. The cloak was uh, a, a symbol of security in the first century. It was actually a fundamental like, civil right of the very poorest of the poor because it was your sleeping bag and, and rain poncho and uh, covering against the cold all rolled up into one. To give away your cloak was giving away your very security, warmth, and protection. Where does your security come from, he says, in essence. In verse 41, he talks about if, if someone asks you to go one mile, go two miles with him. He's actually referring to a specific Roman law that Roman soldiers who were, live, who were working in occupied territory, which Jerusalem and Palestine was, right? Rome had conquered Palestine, Rome, and the Jews were occupied people. Jerusalem was occupied territory. So by Roman law, a Roman soldier could compel an occupied person, not a Roman citizen, 
but an occupied person compel you to carry a burden for them for up to one mile. You remember the story, right, about uh, Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross for Jesus. There's a law that said he had to, if a Roman soldier told him to, for up to one mile. Jesus is actually referring to that here. If someone says go one mile, that's the extent of the law. Go two. Think how radical that is to an occupied, the Rome, Rome was the enemy of God. Rome were the oppressors. Jesus is saying, you have to go one mile, but go two miles for the hated Roman soldier? It's unthinkable. In other words, where ultimately does your freedom come from? Verse 42, when our possessions are threatened, how attached to you are, are you to your things? Do you own them or do they possess you? I've told this story before, but a good friend, friend of mine named Jerry Root, if you, if you compliment him on something that he has, will offer to give it to you. you I, 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 I have things in my office. Uh, Steins from Oxford, England, when C.S. Lewis's pub, pens and books that he, I've said, I like that pen. Oh, do you want it? No, I don't want it. You have to have it. I said, Jerry, I, I just like it. I just said, I like it. He's like, take it, take it. We get in an argument. He, and I asked him one time, why do you do that? He said, because if I can't give it away, then I don't own it. It owns me. I thought, that's good. I like your car. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jesus is not calling us to be foolish or irresponsible or unreasonable, but he's challenging us to see that life in his kingdom is, is it's not all that, always that comfortable. It's radically different than anything the world would advise. So in other words, put it this way, if you are worried and worked up about your security, about your comfort, about your things, about your reputation, then you are actually not free. You're not free to be gracious and generous and self-sacrificing. Let's look at the next half of the text. 43 to 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on evil and the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same thing? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Here Jesus mentions again the Old Testament law or command to love your neighbor as yourself. We get that in Leviticus chapter 19 and also in the book of Deuteronomy. But he's also referring to the rabbinic tradition of his day which was an interpretation and application of this law. Now, he says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Nowhere in the Old Testament law, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, does it ever say, hate your enemy. That, it's not in there. It's, it's a, a contortion or twisting corruption of the Old Testament law. What had happened was, that's how over time, the teachers of the law in Jesus' day, the rabbis began to teach it. Love your neighbor. And so they had vigorous debates about who's your neighbor. Remember Luke chapter 10, when the expert in the law asked Jesus about this, and, and then he, he says, well, who's my neighbor? In other words, how far does this go? What's the limit of the extent to which I have to live this way? And then everybody else, I'm free to despise, reject, ignore, snub, exploit, even hate. Because love your neighbor as yourself. So if I can put parameters around my neighbor, then I don't have to love those people because they're not my neighbor, right? That was what was going on in Jesus' day. It never said hate your enemy. The common interpretation was that their neighbors were their fellow Jews. So the practice became love your fellow Jews. But pretty much ignore, consider unclean, despise everyone else. And Jesus just blows this whole way of thinking out of the water. This is racism. This is ethnic, racial, religious division. You think that's relevant today? <laughs> it's everywhere you look. He says, there's no distinction. You're not free to hate those people. Not if you want to live in my kingdom. He says, in fact, you are to love and pray for those who oppose you, who hurt you, who you just can't stand, who you fear and despise, your enemy. Think about that for just a minute. Let's think about it in Jesus' culture. First century Palestine. Who's, who are the hated enemies of the Jews? Well, Gentiles in general, specifically, Gentiles, by the way, is just non-Jews. Specifically who? Romans. 
Do you know how crazy this is for him to say this in that culture? Love them and pray for them. And by the way, when he says pray for them, he doesn't mean pray that they get what they deserve. <laughs> That's not the kind of prayer he's saying. He's saying pray for the people you despise most. You ever tried that? Have you ever actually tried to do that? Pray for people that you would consider, you would consider, maybe you don't want to use the word hate, but if you're honest, you're close to it in your heart. I mean, I don't mean just pray for your attitude. Most of us, if I say pray for your enemies, you're like you pray for yourself related to them. I'm not talking about that. Jesus says pray for them. Pray for God to bless them. Pray for their good. Earnestly desire they're good. That's hard. Living in the kingdom then means not only learning to surrender our rights, but learning to love our enemies. This is an astounding thing Jesus says then and now. When you do this, and I'm not very good at it, I'm good at sort of, you know, not overtly hating them and dismissing them out of hand and trying to think about them. That's about as far as I get most of the time. But when you do this, and it's only on occasion, if you really stop and, and, and ask God to help you to pray for their good, for them, for their heart, for their soul, for God to bless their lives, it changes you. He says so in verse 45 even. Listen. He says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In other words, a son, looks, a son carries the family trait. A daughter carries the likeness of her parents, right? A son carries the likeness of his or her, his parents. When you pray for your enemies, you become like sons of the Father, daughters of the Father. What does he mean? He means you take on his character. What's his character? Loving, forgiving, merciful, gracious. You look like him. You look like your dad in heaven. You know Isaiah 55, there's this, this is, I'm going off the script here, but uh, you know. There's a place in Isaiah 55 where it says, um, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways higher than our ways. Right? Even though you've heard this quoted if you don't know the reference, right? God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Most Christians that I talk to quote that verse as a way of saying, who knows why he does what he does? His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We just can't understand God. He's a mystery. It's not actually what it means. That's, that's verse 8 and 9. Right before that in verse 6 and 7, you know what the text says? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Turn to him, return to him, repent, and he will be gracious to you. He will abundantly pardon you, for his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah is saying, God's not like you. He's not going to hold a grudge and try to get even and seek revenge and secretly keep this list of your wrongs and get you for him. Our God abundantly pardons, and in that very way, he's totally unlike you. That's why his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And Jesus says, when you pray for those who persecute you, when you love your enemies, you become like him. You have his thoughts. Living in the kingdom means learning to love our enemies. I love this part about God causing the sun to shine on the evil and the good, and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. I like this part. If it were up to us, what would the world look like? Little black clouds over people as they walked around? Sun on my side of the street? Rain on yours? You know, but seriously, if it were up to us, if, if our hearts reflected how the sun and rain worked, it would be, we, it'd be crazy weather all the time, first of all. But think about that for a minute. How gracious is our God? If God's blessing were determined by my goodness and your goodness, we'd all be in serious trouble. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, writes this, Human love responds to a character of which we approve. But God's love comes in spite of our character of which he does not approve, not because of it. So Jesus tells us that we are to reflect the character of our Father in heaven. But how do you do that, really? How can we forgive our, give up our rights and be radically generous, surrender our self-protecting instinct and pray for our enemies? Really, how, do, how does that work? People just don't do that. Living in the kingdom means learning to be secure in Christ. Because if Christ is your security, then you don't seek it in someone or something else. If Christ is your identity, you're not trying to form it in someone or something else. If Christ is your treasure, you're not trying to acquire it in someone or something else. If Christ is your reputation, you're not trying to protect it, because he, he is it. Let me give you a little way to discern if this is becoming true of you by comparing these, uh, these two, two categories here. The human reaction and kingdom response. The human reaction when you're wronged is revenge, retaliation. 
The kingdom response is forgiveness. Where would you put yourself on that scale when you personally have been wronged? The kingdom reaction is self-protection. I mean, the human reaction, the kingdom response is self-sacrifice. The human reaction is personal freedom. The kingdom response is willing service. Nope, it says sacrifice. We'll say service. That's probably because I typed it wrong. The human reaction is personal security. The kingdom response is radical generosity. Just think about those for a minute in your own life, in your own heart. If that's a continuum, where are you? Jesus says, living in my kingdom looks like this. You're going to get wronged. You're going to get hurt. Remember what Reverend Tony said? Loving broken people is risky business. Jesus himself is the ultimate example of this, isn't he? Think about it. He willingly surrenders his divine rights to go to the cross for our sakes. He gives up his just, he would be absolutely perfectly just in calling down retribution on his enemies. But he doesn't. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued to entrust himself to the one who judges justly. Why? Why? so that he might become for you your security, your reputation, your identity, your wealth, your treasure, your comfort. And you can't lose him. Let me give you, um, to try to make this practical for you, three simple reminders. A friend of mine shared these with me many years ago. Um, Before I do this, let me just, I, I should give this a little disclaimer. Jesus is not saying that we should not stand up for others who are being oppressed. He talks about that in other places. We'll get to that. We should. He's talking about you, your heart. When someone wrongs you, how do you respond? When someone asks something of you, how do you respond? My friend shared with me these three simple truths to bring to mind when you feel falsely accused or personally wronged. And these have been very helpful, for me, helpful to me over the years. Number one, Christ is my defender. Think about that. If you really believe that Christ is your defender, then you don't have to defend yourself. And that's freeing. I don't have to chase down every false rumor. I don't have to answer every question. I don't have to pay anyone back. I don't have to defend my, my reputation. Christ is my defender. I leave it in his hands. Number two, I don't know the whole story. Think about that for a minute. There's always, always more to what's going on than you, than you can see in the moment. When people come to me with issues in their life, I'm always reminded there's always more going on than they are willing to tell or even know. So when someone wrongs you, you don't know the pain in their life. You don't know what's been done to them. You don't know what's going on that would cause them to act in that hurtful way. You just don't know. So don't pretend to know. It doesn't excuse them. It just means there's always more. Number three. This might be an opportunity for the gospel. If Christ is my defender, I don't defend myself. If I realize I don't know the whole story, then I withhold judgment until I have more information to understand. And then I remember that this might be an opportunity for the gospel. But if I try to defend myself and chase down the rumor and pay back and define them based on what they did to me, there's no opportunity for the gospel. There's only damaged relationship. There's only retribution, right? Those have been helpful for me, actually. I keep those in the inside of my Bible. Christ is my defender. I don't know the whole story. And this might be an opportunity for the gospel. And that's how God treats me when I wrong him. It's how he treats you when you wrong him, and you do. And you have. He doesn't define you by that. He forgives you freely in Christ. Kingdom living is not easy. It's easy to stand up here and say this. It's not easy to go out from here and live this way. Jesus says, don't live by the law of retaliation. Live by the law of love and forgiveness. Service. Surrender yourself, because love and broken people is risky business. You're going to get hurt now and then. But Jesus knows about that, because he loves you, and you are a broken person, and so am I. Let's bow and praise him for his love. Father, we thank you for this incredible truth, which... We confess in our own strength we have no power to live this way. 
but by your grace, Holy Spirit, help us to make Jesus Christ our identity, our security, our wealth, our reputation. So we will not seek it and defend it and fear losing it in any other place. Then only will we be free to be generous, self-sacrificing, and forgiving people, which our world desperately needs. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen.